And a very happy day, ladies and gentlemen. Tim Burgess with Maximizing Results again. And um, I want to welcome you back to another video on this wonderful book, Think and Grow Rich. Um, remember, this book has created more wealth than any other book ever written on personal development. There's no book that comes even close to what Think and Grow Rich has, has been able to do to help all of us accumulate true wealth. Now, I know there's other good books out there, and I'm not saying there isn't, but this one book has done more to help more people than any other book. And when we went through the, in, the uh, publisher's preface and the author's preface, and now we want to step into the introduction of the book. Now, the introduction is not one of the principles, obviously. We'll get to the principles in the next um, video. And don't miss that one because that is the starting point of all achievement. But now that we've heard from the publisher, we've heard from the author, um, Napoleon put together an introduction. And um, he says it's all about the man who thought his way into a partnership with Edison. Now, remember, Thomas Edison, he's the guy that discovered how we could, you know, walk into our house, flip a switch and, and the lights come on. Um, well, the, the light bulb itself, he didn't figure out everything else, but the light bulb, he figured out how to make that thing work. And this guy wanted to be his business associate with him. And to make sure that you don't miss the first principle, do me a favor real quick, hit the subscribe button. Um, push the subscribe button and then push the notification button right next to it. Do me a favor, share this with all of your friends. They, they truly, they will benefit from having this information shared with them. They will absolutely benefit from that. Also, do me a favor, leave me a comment. Let me know, do you like what we're doing? Do you not like what we're doing? Do you think we're full of shit? Do you think Napoleon was full of shit? I mean, tell us, do you think this is really, really good material? Um, do you like the way it's being presented? Let us know all of that stuff. It, it'll help us help more people. Because I'm on a mission to help as many people as I can become more than they would have become without my influence through the teachings of this book. And that mission is going to continue. And with your help, we'll make it even better. So do me a favor, hit all those buttons, hit the like button, the share button, the notification button so you don't miss any videos. Um, share this with all of your friends. Um, let people know what we're doing here because this is all for you. It truly is. It's all for you. So chapter one, introduction. The man who thought his way into partnership with Thomas A. Edison. He thought his way into a partnership. I mean, I was a, I'm a sarcastic individual anyway, and I was really sarcastic when I first started reading this book because I had a big ego and have a bank account to speak of, but I had a big ego. And um, my first mentor then asked me, what's, what's larger, Tim, your ego or your bank account? Ouch. And he says, truly, Thoughts are things and powerful things at that. And I'm going to say, no, they're not. What, Tim? What? I'm going to say, no, no, they're not. Thoughts are not things. Thoughts are not things at all until. And that's where most people get confused with that message. Well, thoughts are things. I thought it once. I thought a million dollars once. It's not in my bank account yet. What the hell? Well, no, it's not going to be. See, thoughts are things and powerful things at that. Let's continue and please grab the rest of this. When they are mixed with, when they are mixed with definiteness of purpose, persistence, and a burning desire for their translation into riches or other material objects. Notice he said riches, that's the money part, or other material objects. This can be used for anything. So the whole thing of thoughts are things all by themselves in and of itself, that's absolutely false. Because most people think it once. They really don't put any good positive energy behind the thought. It never comes to fruition. And then they doubt whether or not this philosophy works. Hmm. So thoughts in and of themselves, once again, they're not things. When they are mixed with definiteness of purpose, persistence, and a burning desire for their translation into riches, those thoughts become very powerful things, very powerful things. Now he talks about, he says a little more than 30 years ago, and he's going to go into a story about a guy named Edwin C. Barnes. And now that name doesn't mean anything to you. I know it doesn't. It probably doesn't anyway. It doesn't mean that much to me. I wouldn't know the name at all if it weren't for this book, and I didn't do a little research on my own. Um, 
So, but get the gist of the story, <clears throat> get what he's talking about, get the, the, what this guy did to, to truly translate and transmute that desire into its physical equivalent. It says a little more than 30 years ago, Edwin C. Barnes discovered how true it is that men really do think and grow rich. Now, his discovery did not come about at one sitting. It came little by little. <clears throat> Excuse me beginning with a burning desire, a burning desire to become a business associate of the great Edison. See, he didn't just want to be an employee with Edison. Notice it says the business associate of the great Edison. One of the chief characteristics of Barnes' desire was that it was definite. He wanted to work with Edison, not for him. Observe carefully the description of how he went about translating his desire into reality, and you will have a better understanding of the 13 principles which lead to riches. When this desire or impulse of thought first flashed into it, his mind, he was in no position to act upon it. Two difficulties stood in his way. First of all, he didn't know Edison. And second of all, he didn't have enough money to pay the railroad fare to Orange, New Jersey, where the Edison labs were. So, he didn't know the guy, and he didn't have any money to get to where the guy was. Napoleon says these difficulties were sufficient to have discouraged the majority of men from making any attempt to carry out the desire. But this was no ordinary desire. This was no ordinary desire. Do you have an ordinary desire, do you, or do you have an extraordinary desire? Hmm. He was so determined to find a way to carry out this desire that he finally decided to travel by blind baggage rather than be defeated. Now, I didn't know what blind baggage was. What the hell does that mean? Um, that means he went to East Orange, New Jersey on a freight train. He jumped a train. Didn't have the money, so he just jumped on one. And that's how he got there. Now, I'm not saying that you should do that, but I would pose this question. Is your desire that strong? Is it truly, is it that strong? Hmm. So he goes to Edison's laboratory and announced that he had come to go into business with the inventor. He didn't ask for a job. He announced he came to go into business with him. And speaking of this first meeting between Barnes and Edison years later, Mr. Edison said, he stood there before me looking like an ordinary tramp, but there was something in the expression of his face which conveyed to me the impression that he was determined to get what he had come after. Edison says, I had learned from years of experience with men that when a man really desires to think so deeply that he, he is willing to stake his entire future on a single turn of the wheel in order to get it, he is sure to win. Hmm. I gave him the opportunity he asked for because I saw he had made up his mind to stand by until he succeeded. Subsequent events prove that no mistake was made. Now, did he get that business associate, a business associate, excuse me, the day he went there? No, he got a job. The story goes on. If you, if you study this outside of just this book a little bit, the study goes on, say, or the story goes on, says he handed him a broom and said, great, you're hired, sweep the floor. Now, I don't know if that's true or not. I wasn't there. However, what Barnes said to Edison on that occasion was far less important than that, which he thought. And one step further than just the thought, it became a feeling, but more on that in a minute. Edison himself said so. It could not have been the young man's appearance, which got him his start in the Edison office, for that was definitely against him. Remember, he stood there before me looking like an ordinary tramp. Hmm. So it was what he thought that counted. It was the energy that he expressed that counted. We've all heard this, this expression. Um, honey, it's not what you said. It's how you said it. We've all heard that, right? Okay. People always know when somebody's lying to them, it's how they say things, right? Always. Huh. Napoleon says this, if the significance of this statement could be conveyed to every person who reads it, there would be no need for the remainder of this book. It took me years to actually see that. I read it. Doesn't mean I actually saw it. Doesn't mean it registered. And I'm not sure the significance of that statement 
even after 26 years of reading this every day, a little bit every day in this book, I'm not, I'm, wow. Now, remember, Barnes did not get the partnership with Edison on his first interview. He did get a chance to work in the Edison offices at a very nominal wage, doing work that was very unimportant to Edison, but most important to Barnes because it gave him the opportunity to dis display his merchandise where his intended partner could see him at work. He could put his work ethic on display. He could put his attitude on display. He could put it all on display. Huh. So months go by. Apparently nothing happened to bring the coveted goal, which Barnes had set up in his mind as his definite major purpose. More on that later. Very important. But something important was happening in Barnes' mind. See, every day he was constantly intensifying that desire to become the business associate of Edison. Every day he went to work there, he didn't have a bad attitude. <clears throat> Excuse me, his attitude went into shitter over here. He had a great attitude every day, even though he was doing work that was unimportant to everybody. Sweeping floors, taking out the garbage. I mean, it all has to be done, but it's not very glamorous either. Hmm. Months went by, nothing happened. But something inside of Barnes was going on. Now, psychologists, remember, he wrote this in 1937, right? Psychologists have correctly said that when one is truly ready for a thing, it puts in its appearance. Have you ever heard when the student's ready, the teacher will appear? When we're really ready for it, we actually see it. Barnes was ready for a business associate with Edison. Moreover, he was determined, determined to remain ready until he got that which he was seeking. He didn't say to himself, you know, what's the use? I'll try to, you know, I'll just change my mind. We'll get a salesman's job. Here. No, he said, I came here to go into business with Edison and I'll accomplish this end if it takes the remainder of my life. And he meant it. Hmm. What a different story. Napoleon says this, what a different story men would have to tell if only they would adopt a definite purpose and stand by that purpose until it had time to become an all-consuming obsession. Now, unfortunately, when I was growing up, if I was obsessed with something, I was bad. That was a bad thing. Dude, you're obsessed. How many times have we heard that's such a bad thing? Napoleon's using it right here that we need to, for, for this definite purpose, to become an all-consuming obsession. Hmm. So obsession really can be a very, very good thing. More on that as we go through the book. Maybe young Barnes did not know it at the time, but that bulldog determination, that persistence in standing back of a single desire, that one goal, that one definite major purpose, was destined to mow down all opposition and bring him the opportunity he was seeking. Now, when the opportunity came, and this is what we can learn about opportunity as we observe this game we call life. When the opportunity came, it appeared in a different direct, in a different form and from a different direction than Barnes had expected. Napoleon says that's one of the tricks of opportunity. It has a sly habit of slipping in by the back door, and often it comes disguised in the form of misfortune or temporary defeat. Perhaps this is why so many fail to recognize opportunity. Hmm. Edison had just perfected this new office device, this new office machine. Um, known at the time, it was the Edison dictating machine. At the time of the writing, it was the Ediphone. Today, it's all the recording stuff. Everything that records, all the recording stuff going on right now, it was started then. Hmm. Edison just perfected this. His salesmen were not enthusiastic over it at all. They did not believe it could be sold without great effort. They didn't want anything to do with the damn thing. Hmm. Barnes, however, he saw the opportunity. He had the right attitude, the right frame of mind. And it crawled in quietly, this opportunity did, hidden in some queer-looking machine that no, interested absolutely no salesman in the staff except Barnes. Barnes knew he could sell it, and he suggested this to Edison and promptly got his chance. He did sell the machine. In fact, he sold it so successfully that Edison gave him a contract to distribute and market it all over the country, all over the nation. Huh. And out of that business association grew the slogan made by Edison and installed by Barnes. So nobody else wanted to sell it. They didn't think it, could, it would work. 
Barnes said, give me the opportunity. Took that opportunity because it was such a major desire. Became the all-consuming obsession of his life to be the business associate of this guy, Thomas Edison. Now, at the time of the writing, the Business Alliance has been in operation for more than 30 years. Out of it, Barnes has made himself rich in money, but he has done something infinitely greater. He has proved that one really may think and grow rich. Huh. How much actual cash that original desire of Barnes was worth to him? Napoleon says, I have no way of knowing. Perhaps it brought him two or three million dollars, but the amount, whatever it is, becomes insignificant. The amount, whatever it is, becomes insignificant. Please catch this. Insignificant with the greater asset he acquired in the form of definite knowledge that an intangible impulse of thought, the intangible impulse of thought can be transmuted into its physical counterpart by the application of known principles. Hmm. Barnes literally thought himself into a partnership with the great Edison. He thought himself into a fortune. He had nothing to start with except the capacity to know what he wanted and the determination to stand by that desire until he realized it. To know what he wanted. Do you know what you want? Do you know what you want? If you don't know what you want, how in the hell can you ask for it? You can't. He had no money to begin with. He had but little education. That gave me hope. He had no influence, but he did have initiative, faith, and the will to win. My bet is you have all of those things. This guy's no different than you. He's no better than you. With these intangible forces, he made himself number one man with the greatest inventor who ever lived. To this day, he could still be called the greatest inventor that ever lived. That's up for argument. I'm not here to argue with anybody, but could be called that. Napoleon says, now let us look at a different situation and study a man who had plenty of tangible evidence of riches. Tangible is what we can hold on to. It took me, I had to look this stuff up as I'm reading this book, you know, 26 years ago. I didn't know what any of this stuff meant. Tangible, I can hold it. Intangible, I can't even hold it. Um. This guy had plenty of tangible evidence of riches, but he lost it because he stopped three feet short of the goal he was seeking. Three feet short. In our next video, I'll go into that and um, why it's important for us to really study that so we can learn and we can recognize the signs when it's getting ready to happen to us. So do me a favor right now. Once again, hit that like button. Hit the subscribe button. Hit the notification button. Um, do me a favor. Take this video and share it with everyone. That one little story about Edwin Barnes. You probably know somebody in your life that's like that. You have Edwin Barnes and, and those qualities inside of you. But what do you really want? See, Edwin Barnes knew what he really wanted. And until we meet again, the first thing I'd like to do is thank Joe. Joe, thank you, sir. And um, next, as we uh, always desire, our desire is for this day to be the best day you've ever experienced in this game we call life. Yesterday doesn't matter. Tomorrow isn't here, but we can allow this day to be the best day. So please do that. Allow this day to be the best day you've ever experienced in this game we call life. Tonight, when you put your head on the pillow, please do so with a mindful of peace. And may God bless each and every one of you. Have a fabulous day.